Hi everybody, it's Neve here from, from Product Tank Birmingham. Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, so this evening we'll be hearing from, from Tony, um, Collaboration Director at Resolex. And what we're going to do is we'll just um, wait a couple of minutes here before we kick off um, to give everyone a, a chance to, to jump into the session. Fantastic. Cool. Um, whilst we wait, I will just share my screen here so we have a chance to kick off um, when we jump in. Perfect. Um, Tony, I might need your help on this. Are you able to see the Product Tank Brum logo on a slide? I am, yes. Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks for confirming. Always the fun of um, streaming when you can't sort of hear back from the audience there. You want to make sure you've got everything on screen. Cool. So we'll wait till um, sort of, we'll wait an, another minute. And um, what's great about this talk um, this evening is it's being recorded. So if anyone sort of missed the start, then it all uh, will be available on the Product Tank Brum, um, sorry, the Mind the Product YouTube channel um, on there too, with the rest of the talks um, that are happening on Product Tank sort of across the world at the moment. Awesome. Okay, and so I'll kick off with with a quick intro uh, to Product Tank here. Um, run through the agenda, a little bit of background to Product Tank, um, and then I'll hand straight over to to Tony to get into the talk. So, um, what do the timings look like for this evening? Um, due to the current circumstances, of course. Um, Almost all event, events are moving online at the moment, and uh, we're so glad we could we could make this talk. And um, Tony, that you were available to to join us online this evening. Um, this is actually the first um, virtual Product Tank Birmingham talk, so hopefully this all goes well. So um, rough timings, we will be um, going through having the introduction. We'll be jumping into Tony's talk, um, and then afterwards we will have um, chance for a Q and A session. Um, so you should notice to the right hand side of the of the stream, there is a place where you can input any questions that you might have as, as Tony's going through his talk. Um, so please do feel free to drop in any questions and there'll be plenty of time um, for that at the end. Cool. Um, so what is Product Tank? So Product Tank was started in 2010. Um, so about 10 years ago now. Um, and it was founded by product managers. And as product managers, um, we know it can be, you know, quite a lonely job. Sometimes you are um, the single product manager, whether that's in your team um, or sometimes within your organization, too. So Product Hunt was really founded to help product people meet and learn from each other. And what's really exciting is Product Tank is now available um, there's meetups happening in over 200 cities across the world. And um, so it can all feel a little bit less lonely now. And how does it work? Um, so Product Tank is run by product people and it's for product people. Um, so we have fairly informal events um, that tend to be face to face with, with pizza and beer. So we'll have to make do with what we can find in our houses this evening. Um, we tend to have one to two speakers um, or sometimes we do alternate format. So things like workshops, um, we've done product therapy before. So anything to really get the conversation going. Um, the only rule we have is sort of no sales pitches, um, but we're here to share, learn, network and have fun. So outside of the events that we run with Product Tank, um, we also, um, so we have our monthly meetups here in Birmingham. Um, there's also a Slack channel you can join. There's the Mind the Product blog. Um, if you are looking for uh, jobs, there's also a job board on Mind the Product. Um, and there's also a really great podcast, which is the Product Experience Podcast. And, you know, things like the Slack channel are great at the moment where we're all um, sort of um, it forced into remote working at the moment to keep up those communications with, with other product people. Um, just a slight update here um, on sort of moving from Meetup to the Mind the Product website. 
Um, so Meetup is looking to start charging um, for their attendees, for their RSVPs. Um, and so at the moment, we're sort of in between. Um, we have our events up on Meetup as it's a, it's a great way to sort of find events. Um, but we have all of our RSVPs running through uh, the Mind the Product um, website um, in Product Tank there as well. So it kind of brings together all of that Product Tank community in one space. Um, as we want to maintain this Meetup being free of charge and open for anyone to attend. Um, we don't want to sort of have to be paying per RSVP. So um, we're really looking to make that shift to the Minor Product uh, website. And as you can see, uh, we're not being hosted by uh, one, of our, one of our sponsors this week. We're not in anyone's office um, with lots of tasty pizza and beers. Um, but what we did want to do was say a, a special thanks to all of our sponsors um, who continue to support us throughout the year. Um, so to Talis, Kanos and, and Box Pop me. Fantastic. Okay, so moving on to our talk this evening. Um, and so this evening we are hearing from Tony and I may mispronounce your surname. Um, Kowellen? Kowellen. Kowellen, <laughs> excellent. I, I was practicing earlier. Um, so I tried, <laughs> um, who's collaboration director at, uh, at Resolex. And what we'll be hearing about today is, is the influencing from the middle. Um, as product managers, we're often functioning um, from within the middle. Um, we're influencing without you know, that authority or, or line management there. So we're really looking forward to, to Tony's talk um, this evening. So Tony, I'm going to jump off here and hand over the screen share to you. Okay. How's that? Oh, it's not come through yet. Let's have a look. Perfect. Yep. It's there. Yes. Okay. Yep. 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 So, so you can see the see the PowerPoint deck, yeah. Yeah, we can see the PowerPoint. Okay, yeah. right. Um, um, yes, this is this is a um, unusual experience for me. I'm, I'm usually quite comfortable talking to live to to audiences, um, but this, this effect of becoming a broadcaster is, is an entirely new experience. Um, I did actually speak to to a friend of mine who teaches people and teaches people how to to speak to camera and that sort of thing. She said, "Well, you've got to stand up straight and you've got to imagine your audience." Um, and I'm trying to think, trying to imagine what what does a, a typical um, product manager look like when they've been in in a lockdown for five weeks? <laughs> I mean, are you are you dressed? Um, are you opening your your fifth can of beer of the day? I, think, I, I like to think of you all as actually sitting there in in, in rapt attention in in whatever your state of um state of being. So, as Neve said, I'm going to talk to you about the art of influence, um, something that I have. Uh, learned a lot more about over the last eight years since I, I, I used to work in the construction world. Or I still still sort of do, but I'm no longer a, a, a techie. Um, I now work mainly as a as a, a coach, a team coach, or a trainer and a, and a um, consultant. And but there are things that I, I've learned over this recent year, through the years of, of study and research into how teams work um, that I wish I'd known when I was in my twenties and thirties. Um, and I spend a lot of time talking to to project managers, but um, and they most definitely have a, a continual need. They're always trying to to manage from the middle. But as I've learned to understand a little bit more about what a product manager does, you guys definitely are stuck in the middle. Um, whether you're working with a large number of people and where you're you're coordinating and trying to connect different teams, or whether you're leading a cross-functional team and you're and you're working. Um, in the center, where in each case you might um, might be person who's running the the, the coordination and, and and pulling everything together, but in itself you don't you're not able to command or direct people to do what you'd like them to do. Uh, so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk for about twenty five minutes or so. But what um, would then be useful is if you've got any 
current influence strategies or current influence challenges, then we can look at those and maybe I can offer some <clears throat> some thoughts or ideas as we're going on. Um, there is also scope for more specific questions, um, as Neve mentioned at the very end. So what is influence? Well, in the context of the role of a product manager, it's the capacity to have an effect on the behavior of another person. And it's this word behavior is, is, is the crucial thing because it's not just having the ability to change how somebody might think, it's then having the ability to change, also change what they will actually do, which is inevitably much more useful. And there are three concepts that I'm gonna talk through and you'll find that they are largely all interlinked but they're the sort of um, elements that come up when people talk about the art of influence uh, or managing from the middle. So we're going to talk, look at lateral leadership, uh, the concept of currencies of exchange, <clears throat> and then, then the area that I'm predominantly interested in, which is adopting the influencing mindset. So lateral leadership. What is lateral leadership? I mean, leadership as a as a word it would generally imply, if you're a leader, then you've got a degree of authority. Um, but actually, as one gets into the concept of leadership, really, it's around you, you don't need, need authority to be seen as a leader. Um, so the idea of lateral leadership is this sense that um, you, you have an impact, but it's actually without, as, um, without, without the formal uh, structure which says yeah, this is where you sit in the organization chart. Um, as I was doing a bit of research into this, I did a bit of, typed into Google and um, found this quote from Tim, Tim Herbig. Some of you may have even come across him. Um, the quote was from an article that was um, published following the Mind Product um, conference in Germany, I think in 2018. And, but I thought it was what he just says is lateral leadership describes the art of efficiently influencing others around you without formal authority. But the bit I think is quite useful is that he says, it's essential for succeeding in the implicit leadership position that product managers find themselves in. Uh, so what I take from that is, is whether you feel you're in a leadership position or not, um, that the role has implicit leadership attached to it. You are expected to behave or to show some leadership qualities, um, even if nobody actually says that out loud. So where, where this leads us then is to the idea of teams and um, the lateral leadership can only really apply in the concept of where you're working with people in genuine cooperation and collaboration, as you would typically find when you're working in a team. And what I call a real team, all too often we tend to use the word team to describe uh, any grouping of people who happen to be working on the same project or working in, even in the same organization um, in terms of, of the dynamics of, of human dynamics and, and, and how they work together, how people work together, a real team is something quite distinct. It's a smallish number of people, usually between five or nine, who are, are focused on a common goal. And that common goal is, is the thing, the key thing. That's the thing that ties everybody together that this is something that we all recognize we're trying to achieve. Um, the other element then about being a real team is that there's a recognition that it's a, it's a mix of skills and that there's a degree of mutual interdependence. So I can't succeed if you don't do your job and you can't succeed if she doesn't do her job. <clears throat> and so what we're looking for is to get to a place where we work together so effectively, we trust each other, um, so that we become a very a strong problem solving unit, because that's actually what real teams do. And, and you see the heading there, I talk about the power of co-creation. And co-creation is one of the, in, within a team, is perhaps the most powerful way of influencing behavior. Um, and it works on the basic principle that I could be the team leader and I could tell you what you should do. Well, whether you do that or not, it pretty much comes down to whether you decide you're going to agree with me or not. The co-creation, the method, mechanism for co-creation, is where you actually engineer a situation where everybody contributes to the creation of a set of rules or um, to an idea. And by getting other people 
into a place where they say or agree this is how we should work together, <clears throat> co-created rules therefore tend to stick. Um, <clears throat> now, that might seem a little bit glib, but it's a, it's a great way, certainly in the early stages of pulling a team together, is to actually work out, you know, so how are we going to work together? What are we going to do? And it's your chance to influence and shape behaviours by asking questions like, so what kind of meetings should we have? Um, <clears throat> how, what are our rules for a meeting? How are we going to communicate? All those things that bug you normally, all those bits of, um, or things that you might hope would happen, but can't guarantee they'll happen. By co-creating a set of rules with your team at the start, then you've got a much greater chance of making them happen, stick and making them happen. The last <clears throat> um, point there, I talk about level two relationships, because this is something that, again, might seem fairly obvious, but certainly when you're working with larger teams, um, where you're connecting groups of sub teams from, from different parts of the organization, it can be very easy when we're dealing with people to look at other, um, somebody in a role and not see the human being on the other side of that role. Um, so a very interesting book called Humble Leadership, written by um, father and son Ed and Peter Shine. And they talk about um, the levels of relationship. And the, the worst form of relationship is a level minus one which they describe as coercive and dominating, where you are being, where one party has so much power and authority over somebody else <clears throat> that they can make them do what they want. Um, their view, and I ultimately agree with it, is that really there is no place for coercive <clears throat> relationships in the modern workplace, which doesn't mean to say they don't exist. The most common form of relationship is, is the level one, what they call the level one relationship, which essentially it's impersonal. So we see somebody in a role, um, but that's John Smith in that role. If somebody else happens to come, he, John Smith leaves and <clears throat> Tom Smith takes his place, um, we don't really mind or care because we don't know anything about John. We don't really know much about Tom. Um, so our relationship with them is entirely transactional. And all too often in the modern workplace, we can actually get into a place where we don't know the people that we're having to deal with. What the Sheens advocate is getting to a place where you see the human being that you're dealing with. <clears throat> because once we see the human being, then we empathise with them, we can work with them on a different basis. And so we see the relationship with, with we're looking for a relationship that's personal that becomes cooperative and, and ultimately trusting. <clears throat> now these kind of relationships don't just happen, you actually have to work at them. Um, but the best way really is just to ask people questions and genuinely listen to their answers. And I'll talk a little bit more about questions later. Sheen's recognized there's a third level of relationship, which is much more emotionally intimate and where what's highly familiar. These are the, perhaps the one or two people that you might be, be really good friends with. Um, relationships built up over time, and it's a relationship that will uh, exist long after you both move to different organisations. These are, are fairly rare, and they're not necessarily, it's, it's worth understanding they exist, but it's a level two, that's where we're, we're aiming to operate. Now, understanding the people that you're working with becomes really important when we move to the second element that I want to talk about, which is currencies of, of exchange, um, <clears throat> which some of you may, may or may not have come across before. And it, uh, it really comes from, uh, it's called the Cohen-Bradford model after the authors of a book on the subject. So the model works as follows. There's a the core concept that Cohen and Bradford put forward is to say that you can assume that everybody that you are have to deal with is a potential ally. And that can be quite difficult sometimes because you, you uh, look at the person that you're having to, to talk to or to, to, to communicate with, negotiate with, um, and they just seem disinterested, perhaps aggressive. Um, you have a sense of, oh, God, I'm, I'm never going to be able to influence that guy. <clears throat> but Conan Bradford said, no, there's, there's, everybody has something that they need. 
And the question is to find out what it is. So you just have to assume that everyone is an ally. So in terms of the influencing position you want to get to, first of all, you've got to know what it is you want. And you've got to be, what they say is you've got to be absolutely clear on this, clarifying what do I want, what do I need, what are my priorities? You then have to work out so as best you can, what are the goals and priorities? What are the needs of the person you're going to try and influence or the group that you're going to try and influence? And once you've worked out what their needs are, what are the currencies that you could use to actually swap or to, or to, to exchange <coughs> um, to get what you're looking for? And I'll talk about what I mean by currencies in a second. <coughs> and then through um, building relationships and, 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 and connections and communication, you then use, the, use influence through essentially give and take. Um, now, I've taken this from, uh, that's the image you can find, but actually where I, the, the source that I used for, for these slides was an article written by um, the product manager who introduced me to Neve, um, Mark Anderson, <coughs> um, and he's done a lovely article in medium.com, and if you're interested in a bit more detail about cur cur currencies of exchange, um, <coughs> check out that article because it is it's very well written. Um, but what the currency of exchange does actually mean is they're identifying different people have different drivers. <clears throat> and by understanding what motivates or drives people, then you've got a better chance of finding, OK, well, what can once I know what your hot buttons are, I now know how I can influence or I can what I can say or how I can express myself or what questions I can ask that will get you to a place where we have a meeting of minds. So kind of about the model says, well, it could be inspiration related. So you, you're dealing with somebody who's they're probably big picture thinker. They're concerned with excellence or with ethical considerations. And it's about what, what, what you know, we're trying to achieve a vision here. Uh, so the more you can actually, if somebody is inspiration related, the more you can actually uh, talk to them in those terms, actually to offer or express or exp express what you have to offer to support their vision, then the greater chance that you'll actually, they'll get, take an interest in you and they're prepared to actually help you. But you may find somebody who's entirely different. They're totally task related. It's just, they're just interested in getting the job done. So what you might then have is some resources that you could offer. Um, perhaps you could offer some form of future support. Alternatively, there are individuals who need recognition. They're concerned about reputation. They want they want connections, um, and that you you may within your network within your organisation. Insofar as um, you know, product managers need networking is another fundamental skill set. Um, that you may be able to connect them with somebody that they want to get to know. So again, it's a trade-off between you help me, I'll help you. And then the last two, largely similar way, you're finding somebody who actually they'd love to help and you just have to find a way of <clears throat> um, making sure that they get that as a gratitude or, or the, 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 I'm not sure what self-concept means. I have a feeling that may be a typo on my part, apologies. Um, but as I say, if you want to know more uh, about a more detailed explanation, just uh, have a look at um, that book review. The tricky bit, of course, in this model is how do you work out what people, what people's hot buttons are? What is it that motivates them? Um, and of course, what one way of doing that is to understand their, their underlying drivers that might be revealed by psychometrics. Now. You know, not every, not every firm and certainly not every department invests heavily in psychometric tests, but but some do. Um, but understanding the underlying drivers of the people you happen to influence is inevitably going to be quite helpful. And so I've just used what I've got showing here is is a is a triangle that is the chart that's used to identify. Um, the motivation, the core motivations of people um, and works around, it's called the, the strength deployment inventory 
Um, now, what I like about this triangle or this, this psychometric is it's simple enough that most people that I talk to about it and take them through a, a, a slide deck training routine can actually identify their position on that graph pretty quickly. Now, I don't have time to, to cover this in detail now, but you would fill in a questionnaire um, and that questionnaire would reveal whether you had a um, whether you were at a strong motivation, what what drove you, um, what was most important to you in a work environment or even in a home environment, were the relationships, the relationship that you would have with your co-workers, um, but perhaps almost as important, the, the relationships between the co-workers who sit around you. So people who are very relationship oriented, um, they tend to care very much, you know, it's it's about the people. Now contrast that with someone with a strong achievement orientation who is it's a what motivates them what drives them is to get stuff done it's a um and it's it's you know they wake up in the morning and it's right i've got to get through my to-do list i've got to got to sort a b c d um alternatively one could find the, the people in the green area they have a process um orientation and guys with a process orientation like to follow a structure they like to start at a and finish at point z um, and they don't like to be forced to do shortcuts along the way. Um, the, it's often you find um, guys with a strong engineering mindset or an accounting mindset. These guys will typically be more process oriented. Um, one will find, not always, but quite often people in, in a, um, a leadership, senior leadership position have got there because they've got a strong achievement orientation. Um, the reality actually is I find that quite a lot of people are also sit in the middle of the, of the hexagon. And as I say, each of you could probably, if I said, right, tell me, just tell me where you think you are now. Most people would go, well, I'm probably a little bit, a um, little bit red or a little bit blue or a bit blue green. The point is, once you know what you are, then how can you identify what somebody else is? But if, if you recognize that somebody does have a strong achievement orientation they're busy busy task oriented um <clears throat> then maybe and you're relationship oriented or process oriented then you have to change your style change your language um to make sure that you're talking in terms that they understand so all you can do really is look for clues and this is what leads us into um the third element i wanted to talk about because the only I like the, the, the concept of currencies of exchange, and, and, and it is absolutely true. But the danger of looking at, of looking at it um, too literally is that one can see it as a, it's sort of a transactional basis. You know, you do this for me, I will do that for you. When actually influence works differently, influence is something that comes over time. It comes, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's partly a skill set. It's partly about how relationships are built um, <clears throat> and the degree of trust and authenticity that you can build with the people around you. So it isn't really something you can always just switch on and off. There's no doubt you can use the currencies exchange in short term arrangements. But actually, if you're working with a team over a period of time, then better, I think, to, to start to adopt the influencing, what I'd call the influencing mindset. Um, so what I mean about <laughs> so the, the influencing mindset could, could be a whole range of things, but what I'm going to use is just um, uh, one concept, which is about <clears throat> th thinking systemically. Um, excuse me, I'll just take a sip of water. Um, <clears throat> and it's a concept that I would call the spheres of influence. And the model works like, like this. So. For you to for you to be influential on somebody of somebody else, as I've said, you need to understand their stuff. But before you can really connect, you've got to understand your stuff. What I mean by that is, um, <clears throat> it's your ability to 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 see the bigger picture, see what's going on, on and manage your own emotions. And emotions are uh, tricky things because they, we cannot 
control our emotion, but we can manage it. And everything we do tends to be, we think something, it stimulates a feeling, and then we react to it. And that think, feel, react um, can often get in the way of rational thinking. So the challenge is to be able to learn to recognize when somebody's annoyed you or somebody's upset you, why have they annoyed you? Why have they upset you? Um, is your response proportional to what they've said or done? Because quite often we can get absolutely livid about a misplaced word in an email or perceive a slight when actually nothing was there. And the point is to understand what's my stuff? If I'm feeling angry, where's that coming from? And that is a very rational response to, to, to feeling the sensation of adrenaline rush or whatever it is, <clears throat> um, to go, no, okay, be rational about this. Why am I, is that my stuff or is that their stuff? <clears throat> what you also need to do is this, what we call oversimplification into cause and effect, which just says, this happened, so that must be the reason. <clears throat> um, because systemic thinking is fundamentally about going, no, this happened. What are the range of reasons that might have caused the situation? And what that helps you do is contain blame instinct. Because blame instinct is, is ultimately absolutely destructive. Blame comes from anger or frustration. Um, or sometimes it's just like it's a sugar high. It's a way of um, <clears throat> rejecting uh, you know, or, or coping with something, something it's like a coping mechanism that says, well, I feel out of control here, so I'm really angry about it. And oh, um, you know, I've got a rush of adrenaline and cortisol. Um, and say it's, it's a sugar high. It, it's a, it may, helps one feel that it's not my fault. It must be somebody else's fault. The problem with blame is once you blame somebody else for a situation, you pretty much give up control of your ability to rescue it or, 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 or to, to retake control over it. Because what you've essentially said is, well, it wasn't me, it was you. So to change this situation, you're the one who's going to have to change, not me. And of course, in the end, that's how conflict starts, begins, escalates and gets becomes very difficult to contain. Now, in terms of influence, <coughs> There are times when you're working with people where it's not so much just your relationship with somebody else, um, but it's their relationship with others in the team that counts. This brings us into the next two spheres. So the second sphere is the interpersonal, my relationship with you. So I know what my stuff is. Now I need to try and understand what your stuff is. And this connects us to this idea of level two relationships. What is it that drives people? What is it that goes on in their lives? What are the factors that influence their day-to-day -day behaviors? Because what we see is just the surface. We never really know what's going on underneath unless we ask. But it could it's not necessarily just about what's going on between you and somebody else. It's also what's going on within the team. What are the dynamics? What, what, what are the, the, for, the forces that are at play at this moment? Team dynamics is a, is a fascinating subject, watching how people watching people's body language, watching how they interact and interrelate. Um, and as a team coach, it's, it's an amazing thing to, to, to have the privilege to sit on the sideline of a, of a team meeting or a team team event and actually watch the dynamics play out. But it's a great, it's a skill that anybody can learn. All you need to do is to have the, the ability to, to, to sit back and watch. But how a team behaves as a group, you might be working with one with multiple teams and you're trying to understand why one team is so being so awkward, so difficult, or one team is, um, <clears throat> is, is, is being really helpful some days and, and seems to be entirely un unhelpful other days. And again, there, there are different dynamics going in, on in that team that you can only observe from the outside. But worth, worth having observed it from the outside, understand, well, why are they behaving like that? So this is the difference. Cause and effect would we'll just look at it and say, those guys are being dickheads. So they're tickets, and that's and that's that's that I can't there's nothing I can do to, to about that. But sometimes it might be <clears throat> worth trying to understand the behaviors that you see and why you might conclude they're a dickhead. But actually, in fact, if you were working in that team, you would be a dickhead too, because of the factors and the forces that are influencing that team that come from outside, that actually come from the organization. And then even the same applies when dealing with organizations, because one can see work work with 
external organizations and find um, that, again, there's a kind of cultural consistency in their behaviors that doesn't really make sense. So what is it that's going on in their world? What's happening? Um, to, you know, what are the outside influences that are affecting their behavior? And so the point about this spheres of influence model is it, <clears throat> it's just a way, it gives you a, a systemic method of inquiry. <clears throat> it's a way of, of looking through, it gives you an, a range of perspectives as, as opposed to just leaping to one conclusion. And it gives you a deeper set of questions. And as I'm going to talk about in a minute, questions are the ultimate secret of influence. And so you, if by getting a deeper set of questions, you get better information. And then you're able to focus on the root cause and not just the symptoms. And so when it comes back to influence, showing that you really understand the people that you're trying to influence is just simply in itself is a, is a really powerful tool. Um, it's a really good book that I'd highly recommend anybody's written, crikey over 40 years ago now called The, <clears throat> the Seven Habits of, of, of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. And it's something I pick up every five to 10 years and have a, a flick through again, because there are some absolute gems in there. But what, one of the things that he says is that, you know, <clears throat> letting people know that you understand what, they've, what they're what they feeling, what they're thinking um, is immensely powerful because the human being loves, you know, we yearn to be understood, particularly when we're in a frustrating situation. So this brings us to sort of the end of, of, of the, um, the section that I want to talk about, which is about the power of questions. So when I'm lecturing to, to I lecture to project management students, and um, <clears throat> one of the questions that I ask them is, you know, who, okay, um, in a conversation, Who's the one in charge of the conversation, the one who's talking or the one who's listening? And instinctively, a lot of people jump to go, well, it's clearly the person that's talking. Um, but actually, if you think about it, <clears throat> what are they saying and why are they saying it? Invariably, what they're saying is in response to a question that has been asked by the listener. Now, OK, there's lots of circumstances where the talker is just talking and the listeners are pretending to listen. but you understand what I'm saying, I hope. Now, a great thing about questions is they, they, they are the best way of revealing information because you ask questions in the right way, you can get people to reveal thoughts. Now that, and of course, that's, that's always very useful, but the really powerful stuff comes when you also sometimes ask the question, well, and how do you feel about that? Now, be careful with that question how do you feel? Um, something I've noted, noticed on, the, on almost a slightly uh, a comical trend one sees now on, on television, particularly um, after sporting events where a presenter rushes onto the, to the field and shoves a microphone under the face of, a, of um, the winning team or the losing team and says, how do you feel? And surprise, surprise, they start crying. Now, grown men crying on live TV, or oh, not very British, is it? Um, but what's happened is because they were totally unprepared for that question, how do you feel? Um, there, <clears throat> there's been an emotional, bi a rational bypass, and it's just, just gone straight into the limbic system. And they start to actually feel the emotion really coming through, whereas they might have contained it before. Now the emotion has really hit high level um, to the point that they actually start to cry. And because they can see the anger and irritation in their face, that they feel embarrassed and annoyed. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a it's a mean trick, I think, to some, that a lot of too many too many TV interviewers use. However, perhaps used less um, uh, less cynically, less coercively, it's a great way of actually getting under the skin of somebody and just trying to find out. Okay, so you've told me what you thought, and you're a bit annoyed about something, but how do you feel about it? Um, so till they actually then say, you know, so they might have said, well, this is happening, that's happening. And you ask them how they feel. Well, they might say, oh, it's fine, actually. Um, or they might say, actually, no, it really, really, really hacks me off. Now, once somebody's actually started to tell you how they feel, they've changed the relationship with you. You're no longer working at level one. 
you're starting to move into a level two relationship. The other great thing about questions is that you can ask a question in such a way that you prompt the responder to think about an issue from your perspective. So you might know what the answer is, and therefore, although you know what the answer wants, what they know the answer you want to come to, but rather than actually saying, this is what I think the answer is, you can ask the question. So given that A and B and C are happening, what would you think, what do you think we should do? And because you've used that precursor of what A, B and C is happening, what you're doing is you're channeling the other person's thinking. So they can only really think of it from your point of view because they've taken your criteria into account. Um, now that might sound a bit, uh, perhaps a bit manipulative, um, and I guess used in the wrong situation it is, but it's a great way of saving time and getting somebody, getting <clears throat> a conversation, getting somebody into a place where they can say, yep, yeah, yeah, well, this is, um, this is what I think. Now, even better is actually then, if you can get somebody to think that your solution is their idea, then you're away with the mixer. Um, but that can be a bit annoying, annoying, can't it? When, you know, somebody else pinching your ideas. Well, um, my, one of my old mentors said to me many years ago, he said, Tony, um, what do you want? Do you want credit for the idea or do you actually want to see it happen? And of course, in the end, what was more important to me was to see it happen. And if somebody else takes the credit for it, well, that's fine, as long as we get to where we want to get to. So, how would I summarize what I've been talking about tonight? Well, I think the first point is, is again, it's, and this is another quote from Stephen Covey, is seek first to understand and then be understood. And it's a great rule in life, never mind just about being influenced. <clears throat> no, just, it, it's, it, I could use the phrase, slow down to speed up. Now, what slowing down is about is just taking that moment, rather than leaping in, just to go, well, hold on, what's, what's going on here? What are they thinking? Do I understand this situation? Before I leap in with my conclusion, maybe I just want to get ask a few more questions and get a bit more information. And then, again, great lesson in life. You know, it'll take you a long way if you can learn to ask great questions and then actually really listen to the answers. So that gets me to the end of what I wanted to talk about. Um, I mean, this deck is available anyway, and it's recorded. Um, I have a website called the teamcoachingtoolkit.com, and that's where I put a lot of this stuff on um, uh, things like influence and, and systemic thinking. Uh, so if you if you want to see a bit more of that, um, you can find some of that stuff on the website. Um, uh, this isn't a pitch, but actually there's even more of it in a book that I wrote a couple of years ago called the Team Coaching Toolkit. Um, but please, you know, just stay. You know, I, I'm always very interested in different industries and I'm fascinated by the world of, of product management. So connect with me on LinkedIn and um, if you have got any questions on this subject, um, any quandaries or then I'm happy to be the agony ant. So email me and, and ask away. So I'm going to stop sharing now and see where we um, are. Fantastic, Tony. Um, that was Brilliant, brilliant talk there. So um, thanks for thanks for running through that. So we do have um, a couple of questions coming in. And if you do have any questions um, for Tony on the on the talk he's given this evening, please do pop them into the into the chat and we'll we'll run through as, as many as we can. Um, awesome. So I'll kick off with a question from uh, Zena here, um, Tony. So with the move to remote working, and I think this is going to be relevant for everyone watching today, um, with the move to remote working, how does this affect the dynamic of relationships? And do you have any tips for maintaining relationships um, with those you need to influence on um, via online methods? So technology aside, I think the, 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 the key principle around um, or, or the challenge, what the, the perceived challenge around remote working for a team is that we we lack face-to-face -face interaction. And when we when we can see people, certainly see their full bodies, rather than you know at the moment you know, I'm sitting talking square onto um, 
a screen. That's not actually how we see most people. We see them at all angles. We, we see um, the arms moving around. We see their, their faces moving. Um, we see their reactions when they're not necessarily talking with other people. We pick up these clues all of the time. And these are, are largely missing when you're dealing with a, a, an online team. But that's, you know, that's the breaks, you know, so so part of it is recognizing it isn't, it's rarely going to be, be a situation where you can, um, can get that advantage, but it doesn't mean the team isn't going to work. And it's been interesting to see how, well, I mean, a, there's been a huge amount of stuff published, um, innumerable articles on the subject of, of the best ways of remote working or whatever else. Um, but I remember reading one of the more leading thinkers on this topic a while ago um, before COVID-19 um, came up. And her view was that, you know, that there are more and more teams forming around the world that have to work this way anyway. And if you set up your team knowing you're going to have to work in this way from the start, then you've just got to take the extra steps that are needed. The key, I think, is to spend a bit of time with the just doing the level two relationship thing so with people you if you're working with a team that you don't know that well there are i mean so you, know, you, you might have a um just do a number of questions so things like right everybody fills in what's it called it's like a, a team it's a team team catalog or a team manual where each person says right okay following questions you know what 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 winds me up? Um, what's the best way to communicate with me? And, and there are a range of questions that um, you can devise, which are all about revealing a little bit more, going a little bit deeper um, as to what motivates somebody in work mode. Similarly, I think it's it's, it's a great idea if people want to play of, of, of adding something in which is recognizing you know, what is it that goes on in your life? What happens when you're not in front of the screen? What's happening in your house? What what um what are you thinking? What are you feeling um, about things at the moment? And you talk about the real life as it's affecting people at, at every the moment, because it's this sense of emotional connection that we're seeking for to try and build better relationships. There's a lot more stuff about the dynamics of on, online teams, um, but I think in terms of of how do you connect with people that you're only dealing on on a, on a regular basis, trying to find these habits of just keep on talking, get a, you know, when you first uh, interact, don't go straight into the, the task issue, talk a little bit about what's going on in your world, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Tony. Um, awesome. Okay, another question in from KG. Um, so, Tony, what advice um, do you have for product managers when it comes to influencing upwards in particular? How does the power dynamic of seniority affect the ability to influence? <clears throat> so this is this is one that can be quite specific to the individual because it's actually the key. Then it, it really is this point of understanding what what is it that um, that motivates the the manager, the boss, um, the senior individual. So <clears throat> um, you know you have a situation where you don't necessarily you know you may not know them that well um but they they are the person who hold, holds your budget or holds access to your resources that you need how do you influence them you have to find out what is what it is that they need um and the, the best way if you can is to have a conversation and so it's saying um hi you know have you, have you got have you just got time for a cup of coffee um and try and find that opportunity to just have a chat. Be surprised how often people, are, you know, even when they're busy, just go, oh, okay. Because, I mean, again, it's useful to understand, are they are they a control freak? If they're a control freak, then they want to control you. So, okay, understand that. Um, do they care? Do, do, are they bothered about your project? Is it important to them? Is it helpful to them? Um, the more you can find out what they're interested in, the more you're then able to adapt and adjust how you speak. I think there was just one other thing, which is the power of smiling and just being somebody who is pleasant to be around. Um, so many workplaces are, have become 
particularly large organizations, every, I notice everybody seems to be, get, become awfully grim, um, particularly when, when <coughs> circulating around managers. Um, and being a manager actually isn't, you know, it's not as much fun as it used to be. It's one of the reasons why I went and found a, a different career. Um, so working with people who just seem interesting or good to work with. So just that, that you know, how, you, how, you, how your body language, how you approach people, um, a smile goes a long way. Fantastic. Thanks, Tony. And I guess sort of a quick one off the back of that. So um, where you have those different levels of, of relationship, um, so sort of your minus one through to your three, how might you sort of deal with someone that you, you might find difficult to move from that level one to level two? Have you ever kind of had any experiences? With if, if, if people don't want to tell you, they don't want to tell you. I, I, and there's one of my one of the clients I work with, is a, um, which is a small um, software house in Reading, and I, I work with them as a team. And there's one guy there who is just, he reveals nothing about himself. Um, it's just, no, I'm here. I do my job. I go home. And you know, people say, how's your weekend? He'll go, good. And yeah. that's his, his signals are, don't ask me because I'm not telling. Um, but the answer actually with those type of guys is just be patient. Because actually, they, you know, they've got reasons for not wanting to, to reveal information um doesn't mean you, you can't get on with them it's just that's that, that's not what they want to do more often i think we just don't necessarily feel comfortable asking personal questions um but you don't have to be that personal you just you just have to show an interest and you know i have found in life give people the opportunity to talk about themselves and they're happy to do so because um they don't often get the opportunity Brilliant. Thanks very much. Awesome. Cool. Looks like we've got a, another question in. Um, this one is from Kerry. So um, regarding the different focus areas for people and how they prefer to work, um, so the achievements, process, um, relationships, are there any tips for identifying what elements are important to internal stakeholders to influence effectively? So, so, so we, one can sort of start with kind of caricatures um or let's say no not archetypes so one could look somebody typically and it, this is not you've got to be careful because it's only a, it's a starting point but people who go into engineering enjoy process it, it, it's it's they, they they love logic and <clears throat> and rational sequence so if you're dealing with 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 technical groups um you know to often in it teams you will find guys in there and it's about the process and it's about the rules. And sometimes they can be very prickly and very difficult because what you're trying to do is to get them to take shortcuts and they don't like shortcuts. Um, if you're dealing with um, people in, say, the legal team, quite often the legal team will sit somewhere, you know, lawyers sit somewhere between achievement orientation and, and, and the rules because their skill set, their knowledge base is based is around um, how do I how do I make the rules work to achieve what we need to achieve? Um, people in creative professions quite often tend to be more relationship oriented. So marketing people quite often will be um, that sort of blue motivational value system. Um, I find I found a lot of designers um, work in that, uh, that area, <clears throat> and then um, again your archetypal. Chief executive, archetypal director, is somebody who's pushed their way to the top, and they've got there because they have a very strong achievement orientation. <clears throat> and the reason it's useful to, to understand these differences is then that, or, or, or these archetypes, is that they, that's a, that's your starting point. That's your sense check to go. Okay, so is he really is is that guy really achievement oriented? Because I know plenty of bosses who aren't. You know, there's people, and I know plenty of <clears throat> of technical engineers who are actually quite relationship oriented um, and as I say quite a lot of people will be closer to the middle than they are at the extremes um, the main thing is it, 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 tips for identifying is watch watch and listen you learn an awful lot from watching and listening um, and, and that sounds a really glib statement but we we don't really have time to do that these days where everybody's in such a rush but when you can 
just sit back, pause, just look at the different individuals and think, oh, and when you have the chance, you know, perhaps ask a question that um, gives you a few further clues. Awesome. Hope that's helpful. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thanks, Tony. And I think um, sort of in the role of, of product management as well, you know, we are um, asking lots of questions and listening um, to our customers and trying to pick up on, you know, um, why why have they asked for this or uh, gauging by way it's it's phrasing um, how trying to decipher why why they're asking for that. So I think um, it definitely sort of spans across that stakeholder management as well. Just that taking that last question, um, advice to from moving from a minus one to to a, a one or a two. If you're in a coercive relationship. Um, the people who who operate that way tend to be very controlling and um, generally my advice would be find a, find a better job which sounds a bit glib but it, it, sometimes you're you're not able to change that um, unless they're a bully and the way to deal with bullies is is that you have to push back and just say no this relate this you cannot work with me like that um, your behavior is unacceptable <clears throat> and and you push hard back surprising how often um with somebody who who operates that way you know, the screaming control freak um when you tell them that the behavior is unacceptable they start crying um which is i think well okay what's going on there and it's because um a lot of people who are control freaks have gotten very they're, they're operating in a very high emotional state um they're highly stressed they're trying to control the world that is uncontrollable, um, and actually, generally, they're not in a very good, they're not, not in a great, healthy state. So the other alternative is just to to feel sorry for them, and um, yeah, an alternative maybe maybe just try and stay out their way. Fantastic! Thanks very much, Tony. Um, it looks like that is potentially the end of the questions. Oh wait, well, oh, one last one last question and discussion point. Okay, so given that um, with the event today um, was online um, as opposed to in person, do you think this sort of talk and influence in general could be more interactive on a platform like Zoom, Teams, rather than a broadcast? Uh, for, from an interactive point of view, yes. I think I think um, Zoom and Teams both work quite well. Um, I, I found myself um, somewhat reluctantly being forced to become more technically aware the age of 62, you know, I tend to leave it to my wife and my children these days. Um, but yeah, so I've so but I've had to use learn how to use Zoom and Teams, and um, yeah, they're great, particularly for audiences of you know, say 15 to 20. Perfect, that's great. Well, thanks very much again, Tony. That that talk was um, absolutely brilliant. So I'm just going to uh, jump back into the presentation here um, and just kind of close off. Um, on there, awesome. Cool. So, um, special thanks for Tony, and thank you for for accommodating online and sort of you know um, broadcasting your talk as opposed to um, being face to face with with all of us in in Birmingham. So, um, thank you very much to to Tony, and thank you everyone um, on on the stream today. Thanks for your great questions and and your participation um, as well. And so um, next month, uh, we will also be hosting another online event. Um, it doesn't look like we will be uh, out of lockdown anytime soon. So um, we're, we're preparing for um, next month, which is World Product Day as well. So um, at the end of May, we will be having uh, Dave Martin, who is uh, founder of Right to Left, uh, talking about the growth um, the product growth engine and looking um, at sort of the human bias behind what may uh, prevent products from being successful. So yeah, it should be, should be another really, really good talk. And uh, we will be publishing that event soon um, for you to be able to sign up. Um, and then just a final note note from us, you know, um, please do get in touch if there's any topics that you'd, that you'd like to see um, or any speakers that you'd like to see. Um, that will really help us um, to guide and, and attract uh, speakers to Product Tank Birmingham um, that, that you're interested in. Also, if you'd like to speak, uh, please do feel free to get in touch. Um, we're always interested in hearing stories from our community members as well. Um, we're always actively looking for sponsors too. If you've got a, a space for us um, when we are allowed back outside um, that you can sort of accommodate us in, that would be great. 
um, continue to participate as well, you know, joining into the meetups and, um, you know, following us on Twitter and our LinkedIn group. Um, I will be uh, sending out a, a, a short write-up with a link to this to this talk as well uh, later on this week. Um, and, you know, it'd be great to hear your feedback on the on the live events too. Um, and if there's any way that you, you feel that they potentially could be improved um, as we move to online here. Um, but yeah, that is everything um, from me this evening. I'll jump back here. And yeah, so thanks again, Tony, for, for tuning in this evening and, and giving us that talk. That's been absolutely fantastic. Um, thanks yep. to everyone um, at home. And we will be in touch soon. Thank you. Awesome.